I've mentioned before how there is a host of bookish adaptations coming down the pipe. Yo Nesbo's The Snowman just bombed at the theaters and is currently sitting at an 8% freshness rating over at Rotten Tomatoes, joining the likes of Boo 2 A Medea Halloween and The Emoji Movie, which is not exactly the company you want to keep when you're a taut Scandinavian thriller. And I'm sure the book is fantastic, but I instead opted to read Matt Ruff's Lovecraft Country. Now, I'm excited to know that this thing is being picked up by HBO for serialization with Jordan Peele attached to it, especially after the success of Get Out. Peele said he wanted to continue making social thrillers, and Lovecraft Country is a blazing fastball right in his strike zone, once again marrying horror with social commentary on the black experience. And it doesn't hurt that the book is just made for TV serialization. And in fact, Matt Ruff initially envisioned this as a TV series pitch. He wanted something like The X-Files, where you have this recurring cast of characters embarking on paranormal adventures, and he gets the chance to explore some of his favorite sci-fi, fantasy, and horror tropes, and how they change when you put a black character at the center instead. The genres have been historically white, but that's changing with the likes of N.K. Jemisin, Octavia Butler, Dexter Palmer, Victor Laval, Colson Whitehead, and more, much to the chagrin of the sad and rabid puppy voting blocks of the Hugo Awards, would love nothing more than to see sci-fi return to its white roots because apparently imagining a world filled with alien races, sentient clouds, killer robots, AIs, etc. does not leave room for people of color. Books that basically demand to see the manager. Now, invoking Lovecraft is a sly acknowledgement of that. I mean, he is a towering and entrenched figure in the sci-fi paranormal horror genre, and he would go on to inspire a whole host of other writers. His name is even used to describe a particular type of genre, Lovecraftian horror. But it also turns out he is a raging mad racist. One of his published poems would end in a beast they wrought in semi-human figure, filled it with vice and called the thing a... Now imagine knowing that and then winning the World Fantasy Awards, which for its 40 year history has been the bust of Lovecraft. In 2011, Nigerian-American author Nnedi Okorafor, who won with her book, Who Fears Death, had to face that. She had to wrestle with the fact that her greatest honor as a writer was a statuette of this racist man. It would go on to spark an online petition that would garner thousands of signatures and eventually get the World Fantasy Committee to remove Lovecraft as the statue's figurehead. So back to Lovecraft Country. It's 1954 and we're introduced to Atticus Turner. He's off looking for his father who's disappeared, trying to dig up his wife, Atticus's mother's past, and he stumbles on the Order of Ancient Dawn and gets himself and his family involved in a generational pissing match between dark forces. It's the type of stuff that Ancestry.com never warns you about. So, through a series of interconnected short stories, we get to explore all these sort of genre best of hits like Haunted House, Ancient Cult, Evil Doll, Alien Horror, Jekyll and Hyde, and more. But the genius of Ruff is that by putting an African American at the center of it, we find out that the real world horrors of racism in Jim Crow America are far more a palpable threat than any paranormal shadow. The horrors of the haunted house, something that Eddie Murphy long ago noted that white people are especially susceptible to. In the Amityville Horror, the ghost told them to get out the house. White people stayed in there. Now that's a hint and a half for your ass. A ghost say, get the fuck out. I would just tip the fuck out the door. <laughs> they walked and looked in the toilet bowl. Was blood in the toilet? They said, that's peculiar. <laughs> I would have been in the house and said, oh, baby, this is beautiful. We got a chandelier hanging up here. Kids outside playing. It's a beautiful neighborhood. We ain't got nothing to wear. I really love them. This is really nice. Get out. Too bad we can't stay, baby. That is nothing on an angry white community upset about a black family moving into their neighborhood and the steps that they might take to convince them to leave. Or the horrors of Atticus getting pulled over and having a state trooper rummage through his truck, manhandle his books, going so far as to crack the spine and bend the pages of his hardbound Edgar Rice Burroughs. Horrifying. Atticus would go on to face off against ancient death cults with dangerous rituals, but that would have nothing in comparison to finding himself in sundown country. Getting pulled over by a white police officer who carefully explains that he would be duty bound to hang Atticus from the nearest tree if he was found within his county after dark. He would go on to slowly draw that sundown 
is seven minutes away, the county line six minutes away, and surely he would not want to be caught speeding on his way there. What follows is a tense account of Atticus making his way to the county border, the police officer riding his bumper the entire way. I was surprised to learn that sundown towns were an actual thing, and by the end of the 1960s, there would be well over 10,000 sundown towns scattered across the United States that barred non-whites after dark. So it makes sense that Atticus would rely on the Safe Negro Travel Guide, run by his Uncle George. It would allow him to find a mechanic that would help him deal with a simple flat tire, to tell him what rest stops he could go to and be allowed to use their washroom, what restaurants would actually serve him. The guide in Lovecraft Country is actually based on a real guide called the Negro Motorist Green Book, or the Green Book for short, started by Victor Hugo Green in 1936. Jewish tourists had long relied on similar guides to help them steer clear of hotels that had a Gentiles-only policy. With highways crisscrossing the nation, more and more motorists were hitting the road to explore the United States. And this proved far more difficult for African Americans, many of whom would pack picnic lunches so they wouldn't have to stop at restaurants that probably wouldn't serve them. Many would even carry portable toilets because making stops in uncertain territories could prove problematic, if not downright dangerous. Victor Hugo Green would compile restaurants, gas stations, rest stops, even people's homes that were amenable to African Americans. Um, it would start in New York and it would expand outwards from there. Victor Green was a postal worker, the postal service being the largest employer of African Americans at the time. And Green would rely on this national network of African American postal workers to distribute and inform the Green Book. Eventually, it would cover all 50 states as well as parts of Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean. At its peak, they've published about 15,000 Green Books a year um, until it was shuttered in 1966. And at the time of publication, you could buy a Green Book for about 25 cents, but one recently went for as much as $20,000 at an auction. You can learn more about the Green Book at episode 201 of the 99% Invisible podcast. You should check out the podcast anyway. Part of the Mount Rushmore of podcasts featuring the likes of This American Life and Radio Lab and is well worth checking out. Lovecraft Country is a great read. Not expecting the format, though, I found the stories disjointed and they transitioned abruptly. And that Monster of the Week format um, can also be problematic. I know that the Capes and Tights shows are especially prone to that and they can suffer if there isn't an overarching story to propel that season forward. With Lovecraft Country, Ruff is more invested in exploring those individual tropes, and I felt like his overarching story could have used a bit of a boost. I never really felt any of the paranormal peril, but he does a great job of outlining some of the racial issues that his characters are going to have to tackle. And I think at the heart of it, that's what makes the story so great, and what has me so interested in what Jordan Peele is going to do with this when he puts it in a TV serialized format. There's a ton of meat on these bones. There's so much for him to work with, and it can't help but be very, very interesting. All right, so reading has slowed down a little bit as of late with the release of Stranger Things 2, which was absolutely fantastic. Bob Newby is my new favorite hero, not to mention the uh, finals for the Overwatch World Cup series, which saw a final game matchup between Canada and South Korea. South Korea, of course, steamrolled through the competition, but still, what a game to watch. What a series to watch. I mean, it really marries the best of Monday Night Football with World Wrestling Federation with this Olympic scope. And it was just mesmerized me. I never thought I'd be an esports fan, but it was great to watch. You can probably still check out some of those games online, but if you've never played Overwatch, I don't know what you're really going to get out of it. But it got me curious. Are there any gamers out there in BookTube? I'd love to know in the comments below, but I suspect that Venn diagram are two circles that don't actually overlap. Still, if you are playing something, whether it's uh, Farmville or Angry Birds or Destiny 2, World of Warcraft, Cuphead, uh, The Stanley Paradox, there's a ton of great games out there. I'd love to know what you guys are playing. Let me know in the comments below. But in the meantime, I hope you all have a great week of reading, and we will talk to you soon. Bye.